How's it going, everyone? Um, welcome to the session using AJAX APIs to navigate user-generated content. Uh, thank you for coming out. Um, hopefully, we can learn a, a lot of good things today. Most, most of what I've done is I've built a website utilizing the Google APIs, and Google asked me to come out here and share that with you. So just to give you a little bit of background about myself, just one slide, I promise here. I'm a software developer um, and consultant. I started a consulting company, Proactive Logic LLC, in 2005. Um, before that, I worked at a lot of online companies up and through the bubble. Most notably, I worked at BarnesandNoble.com, which at the time was the fourth largest online retailer, and it was the number one online retailer using a, a Microsoft stack. So my background as a uh, developer, I've been developing on the Microsoft stack for um, pretty much my whole career. So I started to build the site VastRank that I'm going to show you the components of and how I built them, um, utilizing a lot of the a lot of the Google the Google APIs, but I still use uh, a Microsoft backend. So at BarnesandNoble.com, I faced all of the challenges that you face at a at a popular site with scaling scaling and the and um, all of the 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 technical challenges that go on with working at a large scale site. So that's my background. Uh, an introduction to VastRank. VastRank is a college rating and review website that, that I've built. And basically, you can kind of think of it as a TripAdvisor type of site for going to college. People post user reviews on VastRank. Um, they post the, the detailed review notes, but there's also statistical um, information that people, that people post as well. I have an overall rating for a college, but then also it breaks it down on 10 different criteria that you'll see underneath on the user reviews. Um, based on professors, academics, um, social life, uh, various different, different um, things that you might want to consider when you go to school. So I launched VastRank in September of 2008, and so, so far it's a slow organic growth of my site. It's not an overnight success where you'd see a lot of uh, startups th that are probably here that do a lot better than this, but I, I'm growing my site slowly. I have 40,000 unique visitors um, a month, which for me I'm pretty happy about. Um, the reason I'm happy about this is that I have a day job. I've only created VastRank on an hour a day programming. Um, one of the big benefits is that I actually work from home. So I took the first hour of every day um, at six, six, in the six in the morning to seven in the morning every day and I worked on this idea that I had had for years. So that's basically the background about, about VastRank. Um, and while I built this, again, the Google APIs helped create some really cool tools for the, for the website. So that's enough for the background. What we're going to dig into today, um, I'm going to show you some creative ways to use the Google Ajax APIs. Um, and one of the big components of, of the site, there's a few that I'll go through, but one of the big components that I have is a, is a ranking map. And I'm going to switch over to that right now to show you what that's all about. Um, if I go to vastrank.com, you can see user reviews that have been posted here and so forth, and I have a, a, a map tab. And what the ranking map is, is it's a, it's a map that shows you the highest rated colleges for the criteria that you're interested in based on what's in view on the map. So this is completely dynamic. Um, right now I have academics selected, but you can pick any of the criteria that people rate the college on. So I can choose social life or professors, and this is right against the live site. And as you can see, I'm getting a different uh, different ratings on the left-hand side for the colleges, and then the markers are being dropped um, to reflect those colleges. So the cool thing about this is as you move the map, the, the ratings are completely dynamic. So I'm going to move across the United States, and you can see based on what the user has in view, uh, the, the ratings are completely dynamic, and I'm drawing the top-ranked colleges for what's in view. And it's again, I can, I can change the criteria here and I can change to say academics, and you can see the top for academics. Say I wanted to see um, professors, and you can see that, and then you can um, <clears throat> you could zoom in and take that concept even further. Now I can scroll across the, the, entire, uh, the entire world. I have colleges across the, across the world, so I have international rankings and so forth. So that's using obviously the Ajax, the Google Maps API. Um, another thing that I'm using here is the the client location API, if you notice when I brought up the map, it actually centered the map um, in San Francisco. 
where we are right now. Um, there was a lot of talk about that. Even in the keynote today, they're, they're bringing up client location more and more. And that's like a really easy API to use to tailor user experience to uh, make their experience better. So another, another a API here that I use in Google's is the client locator. So if you look here and I type in Stanford, it's going gonna, it's gonna to geocode Stanford. And if I zoom down here, I should have Stanford University in view. As I mouse over the colleges that are in view, um, on the left-hand side, it's going to just basically put a green little orb on it. So that's, that's using the uh, client location API or the client geocoder um, from Google. I'm going to go back here. OK. So on the server side, I'm going to go over some of the concepts that I had to do to support that map as well. So there's concepts that, you know, you have to learn the APIs. The, the Google APIs are really simple to use, right? So when you're developing an application, it's not really going to be the APIs that are the, the problem. It's going to be the concepts that go along with that. Like, what do I have to do on the server? for instance, to support these AJAX lookups and so forth. Those kind of design decisions that you have to go through as a developer. Um, so I'm going to go through some of the things that I had to think through, some of the gotchas that I faced and so forth, and, and show you um, some of the strategies for that. And then uh, the last section of the site that I'm going to show you and, and how I built it and some of the concepts, again, that, that go around it is personalization. And personalization for me is that when someone comes to your site, how do you tailor their experience when they come to, the, come to your site to make it more interesting um, and more valuable to that user? So primarily, the one, the one piece of personalization that I have on Bass Rank right now is I have this section called Interesting for You. And if you notice on the right-hand side here, it's basically suggesting um, colleges that I might be interested in based on my browsing, browsing habits and so forth in my location. So I'm going to go into that in detail. Um, and how that's designed and how that's built, utilizing the AJAX APIs and so forth. So I'm going to go back here. So just a little bit more background on, on Bass Rank and how, it, how it's built. When I was a computer science um, student at Rowan University, we used to hang out and do the normal things that a, com that a college student would do. We would, we would hang out after class, play video games, go to parties, all that kind of stuff. And I used to sit there and say, you know, how many other kids are doing the same thing as we're doing here? There's got to, you know, there's got to be thousands of colleges and so forth. And being kind of an entrepreneur and so forth, I said, I want to build a website that, that caters to this. So my original idea at that time, being uh, young and naive, was to create a, a site called PartyColleges.com. And that never really came into fruition because I didn't have the, uh, the time to build it. So eventually when I got the time to build this, I started to build the site more and more and add these great rating features and so forth, and it became vast rank. And the initial, the initial idea for Bass Rank, MySpace was probably the, the biggest site, um, you know, social networking-wise at the time that I started to build this. So the initial idea was to have a profile page for every college. So each college would have their own profile page. Um, they don't get to choose to create it. I would create it for them. And then people could post user reviews and ratings on that page. So you'd have comments and so forth. Now, one of the most interesting things about a Facebook, pay, a Facebook profile page or a MySpace profile page is the profile picture. I know that when one of my friends changes their picture, if it looks interesting or something like that, I'll immediately click on their profile. So what would I do to, to take place of the picture? You know, it was hard enough getting the data into my database, let alone getting a picture of each college. So this is where I started using the Google APIs, where I started to dive into them. At the time, I said Google Maps are, are cool. And maybe I can put a uh, Google map in as the, as the profile picture. So you can see here that the equivalent on Bass Rank for a profile picture on a, on a social networking profile is the Google map. So I put that in place of, of the profile picture. And it would be the, that's the same kind of concept that you have on YouTube and so forth, where you have the comments and ratings and reviews underneath, um, and then the video spot. So you know, I didn't have anything particularly interesting to put there, so I put the, uh, the, the, the map. Along with the profile page, there's other things on there, like the ratings and reviews and so forth. Um, so that's where I started to play around with the, the Maps API. Now, another design decision that I made up front was that I had 10,000 colleges in my, in, in my database. And I wanted, to look at, I wanted to have a clean URL structure for navigating down in a hierarchical fashion through the list of colleges. So I have 10,000 colleges in memory. And I want to have these SEO or, or clean um, looking URLs. Here you can see a, an example of a URL, which is 
bassrank.com forward slash US. If you, if you navigate that, you'll, you'll be able to pe page through all the colleges in the United States. Then it goes to California and, um, and, so, and so on. So in order to support this, in memory on the, on the server, I had a, a, a cache of college objects. Um, it doesn't matter what technology you use and so forth, but it's, it's just a cache of, of college objects. And what I would do is I would, the URL would come in, and I would look in my cache, and I would say, does this URL map to one of my colleges? I would then take that college object, and I'd draw the profile from, from this cached object. Most of the stuff that you see on there, the ratings and so forth, are all, all in memory on the server. And I have uh, basically background jobs that recalculate that and re reload the cache uh, periodically. So <clears throat> I had all of these pieces in place. I had the, the Google Maps API uh, integration with the, the profile page and then this cache of objects. So I had my aha moment just playing around with these technologies. It was a side project. So I, you know, it's a time to experiment. I said, wouldn't it be cool if I could, if I could query against the objects that I have in memory with a Google map? So that's where the ranking map came in, in, into play, which we saw in the, in the beginning, where I demoed. As you move the map across, basically it's making calls to the server, figuring out what the user has in view on the map, and then taking those colleges that I figure out are in view, um, and then returning that back down to the client um, ordered by the, the ranking for that school. So <clears throat> what, what I do with that, um, we're going to get into the details of some of the things you need to think through and figuring out what the user's viewport is and so forth on this. So enough with the background with that, let's start to dig into some actual real uh, concrete code here. So this is the basic architecture of, of bassrank.com from a client perspective. So of course in the client, in the client you have um, a couple different pieces of code. I have just one chunk of JavaScript that encapsulates all of this. I call it mapmodule.js. Um, it handles any of the events that come off of the map, any of the, when the user selects the drop-down list and so forth, and it, and it handles drawing all of the UI elements that you see on the screen. Um, anytime that any of, those, <clears throat> any of those events happen, it basically makes callbacks to, to, the ser to two different servers, right? You call, you call Google for maps, obviously, um, and some tra language translation stuff that I'll get back to, uh, get to in, the, in the end of the, uh, the slides here and also callbacks to my own server, Ajax callbacks. So that's the basic uh, architecture here. Um, so moving on, I'm just going to go through from the, from the beginning of when the client map is drawn all the way through the server and back down again of how I draw the markers. So um, in the keynote today, they spoke about the, the client location, which is going to be built into the browsers and so forth. And I know in the session before this, um, Pamela talked about the client location that's available today. I'm using the, so the, one of the first things that you need to do for, set, for loading a map is to set the center point on the map. And for a college, it's easy. I have the latitude and longitude for a college, and for a college profile, I explicitly set the center, right? So that's simple. What happens when someone comes to the ranking map, which is not really I'm looking at any particular in college in particular, um, where do I set the center? And basically, if you're using the Google APIs, the Google Loader has a uh, client location property on it, and it may or may not, for the most times it will, have a client location for the user, uh, that is a latitude and longitude, and also their, their, their city, state, um, and country, um, if it's available. Again, it's, it's based on IP address, and that was, that was touched on in the previous talk. So sometimes it's not the most accurate, but when you have nothing else, it's a good thing to try for, for personalizing your user experience. Um, so for the ranking map, I attempt to center the, um, the map on the client's location. Of course, you have a backup if you cannot get the client location from the, from the Google API. Um, so when the map loads, you basically register for key events. The map exposes um, different, different events while the map moves around. The most important for me were is map start or move start, which is basically I clear all the markers and all the detail nodes, and then as soon as it drops, as soon as someone stops moving the map, you, an event is fired. Map, uh, move end, and that, at that point is when I query the server, and then I take the the um, re results back and I draw them on the map. There's also another one that's uh, move that gets basically fired as you're moving the map, and I tried to tie in that originally, but it was just way too much data um, going back and forth. So. Move start and move end were the key events off of the, uh, the map. So 
when one of these key events happen, whether the filter changes that the person's interested in or the, uh, the map move ends, there's two pieces of information that I send out to the, to the server. One is the, the ranking that the person's interested in and then the current bounds for the map. So the current bounds of the map is made available by the, the, the map get bounds call. So on, if you have a, a reference to uh, a Google map from the API, you can call get bounds and it returns back an object called glatlang bounds. And what that, it, what that is, is it basically has two points. It has a southwest point and a northeast point. And those two points are a latitude longitude pair, which happens to be a glatlang object. So from these two points, you have to determine what the user has in, in view on their map. Okay, so I'm gonna go deep into this right now because it's actually, so if you're doing one of these mashups and so forth, it's something that you, um, you're gonna have to take into consideration. So just a, a brief review of latitude and longitude here. One of the important things to note is that the sign changes from, and the, when you look at the equator there, north of the equator, the latitude is positive, and south of the equator, um, latitude is negative. And then in the prime, prime meridian, which isn't shown on the map, but you can get it from the, uh, from the boxes that are drawn there. Longitude does the same thing. It goes from uh, negative on the west, the west side of the prime meridian, and then it goes to positive on the, uh, on the east side. So keeping this in mind, I'm just gonna go through a couple scenarios. So imagine your user has just part of the United States in view. The signs don't change at all. Um, this is the simplest scenario, the easiest one to, to get. And I'm gonna give you just a hard data point here. So if you call that get, that get bounds for the map call, you'll get back two points that actually, these are real points that I got back from the API here. Um, as you see, on the bottom left-hand side, you have a, a 30.25 for latitude, and then the north side, 42.68. Uh, so that basically creates a continuous range, and then the same thing for longitude there with a negative 125 and negative 102. And simply, when you pass that up to, when I pass that up to the server, I'm able to loop through all my colleges and say, is this latitude between uh, 30 and 42, and then the same thing for, for longitude. So for that, it's, it's very simple, it's a continuous range, and anything that's, that's in the, that it's in those ranges is considered in view. So what happens when you cross the prime meridian? Um, <clears throat> here the longitude is gonna go from negative to positive. So the actual call to the API is gonna give you back, for this, for this example here, I'll show you a, a concrete example where it actually crosses the prime meridian. We're getting a negative 128 back on the, on the southwest side and a plus 55.89 on the northeast side. So for this, it still, it still actually works. Um, as you get closer and closer to the prime meridian, it's gonna get closer and closer to zero. So that negative 128 that you see there for longitude, as you get closer and closer, it's gonna be you know, negative 100, 90, and so forth as the, as the user moves their, their view closer and closer to the, uh, the prime meridian. So that's still a continuous range between negative 128 and zero, and then zero to 55. So you, the algorithm still works. Now I'm gonna give you a couple more examples. It will not work at a certain point, which is why I'm going through this. Um, so that still works. So I can still get this call back up to my server, loop through all of my colleges, say, is the latitude between this range eight and 78, and is it between negative 128 and 55? And I can say these, these colleges that I have are in view if they're in those ranges, so that works. The, go, going over the actual equator here, the latitude the latitude's gonna switch signs. So to give a concrete example of this again, you're going to go from a latitude of negative 5.79 to negative, um, or to positive 23.72. So again, that's a continuous range. That negative as it gets closer to the equator is gonna be a zero. And then from the equator up, that's gonna go up um, from zero to 23. So that's still a continuous range. Again, you can loop through, say is the college lat lang within this, these bounds? And if it is, then the college is considered in, in view. So, so far, the variations that it worked, um, simple where the, the, the user's view is just in one quadrant where it doesn't switch signs, overlapping the prime meridian, you can still do this range check to figure if something in, is in view. And then going over the actual, um, the equator there, that also worked. Doing this range check worked for all of those scenarios.
So the gotcha. As you're going through this and you're using this type of logic to say, I'm going to take the min and max point and, and compare my latitude and longitude for my object across these, the one that doesn't work is that as you near the, the international date line, um, you're going to get closer and closer to um, negative, or you're going to get closer and closer to one, 180 degrees um, longitude and negative 180 degrees longitude. Right at the international date line, not 100% specific, but around that area, it's going to make this massive jump from one sign to another. So if you take this, this, this algorithm that we were seeing before, where we take the, the, the southwest point and the northeast point and just see if it's in that range, it's actually not going to work for this. So <clears throat> I'm going to look here. Here's an example of, of this scenario. So right here on the left-hand side, you can see I have part of Japan in view and so forth. And the longitude is plus 116. Um, the, longi the longitude in the northeast part is negative 147. So we're looking at this longitude range now. We have this huge range, right, between negative 147 and plus 116. It's gigantic. Everything is going to fall. Practically everything is going to fall within that range. So you can no longer take these two points that the, that the client locate or the, um, the maps bounds give you and just check to see if your point's within view. It doesn't work anymore. So, for example, Stanford University right here has a, has a uh, latitude of plus 37.43 and a longitude of negative 122.17. That longitude point falls within that massive range. And Stanford University, which is in California, is not in view. We have as only as far um, over as Hawaii there. So the strategy is you need to detect that your longitude has changed has changed signs. Once your longitude has changed signs, you need to break it. You need to break it down. So, just with any problem, as soon as something gets difficult, I had to work through this uh, quite a bit and think through it and draw it out and so forth. You just have to break it down into simpler parts. So, for this, when you detect that the sign changes, I actually this is what I do on, for my algorithm on a server is I, I break it up into two uh, bounding boxes here. So as you can see. The longitude on the, on the southwest side is plus 116, and I just fabricate and use a plus um, 180 degrees longitude for the, uh, for the northeast part of that bounding box. Now, for the bounding box on the right-hand side, I still keep the point that was given to me by the, the, by the client, which is negative 147.3. And then, at that point, I, I fabricate a longitude of negative 180. So I can make these two ranges that I can check. They don't overlap. They don't give me that huge range. So it's actually uh, fairly simple once you think through this and see this. So now that you see this, um, for your own maps, if you're doing any kind of thing where you have to determine what's in view on the user's map, it's going to be really simple. All that you have to do is check, check the range, the max and min ranges that were given to you by the client. And then if you detect that the longitude crosses, uh, crosses, um, crosses signs, you can simply break that down into, into two ranges. Um, and check that to determine what objects that you have geocoded in your database are in view. So at that point, um, <clears throat> what was really surprising to me, I'm doing all these calculations on the server, I'm looping through all of these colleges and so forth on the server, and something that was completely surprising to me, again, what I was doing with all of this stuff was a complete experiment. I had never seen this done um, the way that the ranking map particularly works. For me, it took only 12 milliseconds to do these calculations on the server. I thought that that was awesome. So I'm using .NET on the back end, but I don't think it really matters. Um, I think it's just it's simple comparisons between numbers and so forth. So if you loop through and you're using Java or anything else, I, th I, would, I would think that you would have the same type of uh, performance as I'm seeing here. And this is on top of uh, part of my algorithm as well, is if someone doesn't have anything in view on their map, I basically have a calculation that, that calculates for each one of those colleges the distance from the center point on the map. So all of this, all of this calculation and ordering, then ordering by the rankings and so forth, I would think it would ta take you know, longer than 12 mil milliseconds myself. So this was a nice surprise. And the great thing for that is that the user experience is, is really good. So oftentimes on mashups and so forth you see, you often have to press a button or do something to explicitly re-query um, markers. You know, you have to do a search, you have to click boxes, you have to do something to trigger some kind of event. 
for me, all that I do is on, on, the, map, on the map events that come from, from, the, uh, from the Maps API on move end, I automatically re redo the server. So I'm going against the, uh, the live site here, right? And word I own, who the heck knows how, uh, how good the network connection is right now. But the move end, this is still pretty, uh, pretty quick considering all that it's doing and considering the uh, latency that we probably have here in, at I.O. with uh, 3,000 developers using the network right now. So um, I was pretty happy about that. So again, I embrace experimentation and so forth. That I really like pushing the edges and just um, not following what other people do and just kind of come up with your own thing. And it's nice when you get these nice little surprises when things actually work um, and work and work quickly. So that was, that was nice, um, a nice surprise for me. One of the, so I do all this querying on the server and so forth, and at the end of it, I return back a, a chunk of serialized JSON objects back to, down to the client. And for each one of those college objects that I return back from my own service, um, I basically iterate through all of those, and I'll draw a marker on the map with the marker manager. So I use the marker manager that's uh, available through Google, through Google Code. Um, I use that to manage the markers on the right-hand side, and then on the left-hand side, I'm utilizing uh, jQuery to, to draw the actual detail nodes on the left-hand side. And while I was, when I was invited by Google to actually put together this talk, I was originally just using straight um, DOM manipulation myself, and I moved over to using jQuery. And the thing that was cool about it was that it made, it made things like mouse over on divs and, and all this kind of stuff. I didn't even have to worry about it. You just get those simple events off of jQuery. Um, and that just work. So when I draw, when I draw the marker on the right-hand side, and I draw the the details node on the left-hand side, they're kept in sync. I, there's events that for mouse over on the markers that are exposed by the uh, the Google markers, and then the events that I have from jQuery on the left-hand side. And basically, I keep the two in sync. So if someone actually mouses over any of the nodes, um, they're kept in sync with one another. So if I just go here. I can mouse over and then the, the items are highlighted on the map. So I can go here and I'm just using some jQuery uh, plugins to, to do the scrolling and so forth to make sure things are scrolled in view. So you can get the, uh, the, the whole details for whatever you're, uh, whatever you're mousing over and so forth. So do I have uh, two versions of the presentation open? I must. Okay. Um, so just another thing that I touched on this briefly before with the performance of all of this. Uh, my algorithm for when the user doesn't have anything that's ranked in view, I actually draw things closer to the center. So, you know, latitude, longitude uh, calculation, distance calculations are uh, obviously uh, well documented and so forth. And whatever your programming language is of choice, I'm sure you can find some sample code out there to, find, to do distance calculations. So when there's nothing in view, I still want the user to see colleges, um, so I just draw whatever's closest to the center. I just added international colleges, so I don't have any rankings for what's in view in, in, uh, in New Zealand. So this is just an example of what the user would see here. So to, to move on here, what I, what I used originally out of the box was the original info, info window supplied by the Google Maps API. Um, so the problem that I ran into with, the, with this was that the Google marker, uh, the info window that they supply out of the box, you can't control the direction that it opens. And for me, this was a big problem because the whole crux of what my, my ranking map is is that it shows you rankings based on what's in view. So the info marker implementation out of the box, it will move your map if you mouse over it. So it will move it to make sure that the info window opens in view, um, which for me would change what the user has in view which would make more colleges in view and potentially change the user's ranking. So a user would come to the site, they would, they would focus on the area that they're interested in, and just they want to see the information, and they mouse over it, and then boom, I, the map would move, and then all these markers would re reload. So it was a terrible user experience. Um, one option that I found was that uh, the, the info window has an option to suppress the pan, but I'm not even sure why that's actually there. It is not documented, so maybe they didn't intend anybody to use it, but I use that as well. But it doesn't really make any sense because now you can't see the information that's in view. So this, this implementation didn't work for me. Um, one of the things that I like to do when I encounter these kind of problems is say, can I just get rid of it completely? Like I was thinking about using a third party implementation of the info windows and so forth, but 
maybe if, what can I do to just get rid of this problem and not even think about it? So when I changed my implementation, I added this detail section on the left-hand side, which shows all of the information for, the, for what's in view or what markers are drawn automatically. And I actually think it turned out to be a better uh, user experience. So you no longer have to mouse over each marker to figure out what's going on or what those markers mean and so forth. The, the details are, are returned automatically on the left-hand side. So I love when you can just take something and it's not working for you and you can say, can I get rid of this? Can I throw it away and do something completely different? Let's think about, let me think about it from a totally different angle. So this was my strategy here where you saw the, um, the synchronization between, uh, between all of that. Um, and that's, that's still improving. So that's the ranking map. I'm going to go through a little bit about geocoding and what I had to do for geocoding. So ahead of time, I had this college database which had address information, um, the name of the college, and so forth. I needed to geocode all of the colleges in my database ahead of time. So Google has an HTTP geocoder that you can use. It's, um, it's very simple to use. The interesting thing here, though, is when you start to use it, um, I had all this college information. Sometimes the address information will be inaccurate. Um, sometimes Google wouldn't know about the address information and so forth. And if, even in the best case scenario, if I provided like the name of the college and the address information to the geocoder, it would, at best, give me a, a, an accuracy back of, of eight. And what eight is is address level, uh, it's an, Google has an enumeration that tells you the, the accuracy of the results back from the geocoder. So eight is actually address level. So that would be a point like um, 888 Howard Street in San Francisco. If you, if you got a, an accuracy of eight, it would drop a pin right on that, that spot if you were to use the Maps API to draw that, that, um, that address. It would draw, draw it right on the, the actual location. So that's pretty good, right? But even better, I, 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 had, I had all this data. So I basically write this little script. It would go against the HTTP geocoder, geocode all my data. I'd look at it. I'd say, what do I get back that's not that accurate? What's wrong with this information? So I did a lot of experimenting. And what I found was a really, a, really a great surprise to me was that if I supply just the college name and the, the, the town and the state, I would actually oftentimes get it back in accuracy of nine, which is play, um, premise accuracy, I believe they term it. And the cool thing about that is now I have this really, really accurate um, location. As you can see here, here's a, here's a county college that's actually near where I live, Ocean County College, and it, dropped, it drops the pin. That's the, a pin um, drawing on the latitude and longitude that I got back from the, uh, the geocoder, and it draws it right in the center of the campus. So it knows about this location, which is which is really cool. And then the user gets to see this great outline of the campus and so forth. Um, so the lesson here that I learned was that you can actually try to geocode pl place names and just give it just enough information so that the, uh, the geocoder can figure out what it's doing. And it might actually know the, pla the actual place if you're geocoding locations. I'm not sure what else this works for. I just did it for colleges, but I would assume that there's other types of uh, locations that this works pretty well for as well. Maybe you have data that. Um, your geocoding that would fall into that. Um, so that's the HTTP geocoder, which is used ahead of time to geocode the, the, the address information in my database. Now, I also use the, the client geocoder on the client side. So what we saw before in the demo was that I typed in uh, Stanford on the map, and it geocoded um, Stanford and centered, and I used that information to, to center the map. So here I just have a, uh, a simple call to the, the client geocoder again. As I said before, the Google APIs are simple to use. It's not the, the APIs are just out of your way. They're, they just make sense to me, at least. Um, so you call the API, you geocode, you try to geocode the point. And what the, the, the cool thing about this was that it's really, it's really amazing. You know, when I put in Stanford into that, it's not calling my server and looking at my information for Stanford. It's calling Google, who has nothing, no knowledge of my website that it's a college ranking website. And then boom, it gives me back that point. So the client geocoder is really powerful. It also works with the normal use cases that you would think about, like, like addresses and, and state and, and city and so forth and all that. That all works great as well. But again, the client geocoder does some really cool things. And it just surprises me. I don't think they document what, what it should do um, as far as like the accuracy of things that you can put in there and so forth. But from my experience with just putting in like the well-known college names and so forth, it, it geocodes those uh, very well. So that's the geocoding portion of uh, the presentation. 
The next thing I'm going to go into is the personalization aspect of Vast Rank, which um, is something that I, I really love to work on. Because when I, get, when I get visitors to Vast Rank, they're looking for college reviews of a certain college, right? So since I have a profile page for every college, they land on a college, on a college profile page. Um, and as that user goes through Vast Rank, I want to, you know, we have all this information at our disposal to figure out what the user is trying to do and try to make the site experience better for that, for that user. So I'm going to go through how I do personalization on, on Vast Rank. So here I'm just going to go through a scenario of... Uh, how do you suggest colleges to users programmatically? So we have a user, Kim, here that I want to suggest that the outcome will be suggesting uh, Brown University to her. So just to go through what I, what I do for Vast Rank, I, I'll go through this example where I have a previous visitor, Jamie. So Jamie came to the site. I anonymously track information about users, just using a name here to, uh, to give some context to this. So Jamie looked at Rutgers University, Brown University, and Florida State University. And I have a, a lot of this user information in, in my database. So to just make it this simple, we can go through this. And we have a new user, Kim. So you can imagine Kim types in, I'm looking, uh, I'm looking for Rutgers University reviews or some other keyword that would potentially come up uh, with VastRank, a, a VastRank profile page. She clicks on the profile page. She comes to Rutgers. Now, I see that um, Kim is looking at Rutgers, right? And I look back in my historical data which is more than just one user, but just to keep with this simple example, I can see that Jamie, one of our previous users, has also looked at Rutgers. She's also looked at Brown University and Florida State University. So now I have two additional possible suggestions to give to, to, give to Kim based on other user information. I also have additional information in the best ranked database that draws relations between college, but just strictly user information here. I can take this and Using the client location API, which has come up a lot in this conference. It came up in the keynote. It came up in Pamela's uh, talk as well. What's really interesting about this is I can take, I can take Kim's location, right? And I can figure out where she's, where she's located. Now, using the API, it's just down to IP address as far as accuracy and so forth. But in general, it works pretty well. So she comes to the site. She lands on Rutgers University. I don't know anything else about her other than her location and that she's looking at Rutgers University. Now, I have two possible suggestions to give to her. I can either suggest to her Brown University or I can, I can um, suggest to her Florida State University. So I, t I make a call. I, on the client side, it get, makes a call to the client location and gets the latitude for Kim. And from that, I can tell that Kim lives in northern New Jersey, which is obviously going to get from the client location API, you're actually going to get back a latitude longitude point. But just to give some context to it, she lives in northern New Jersey. Now, northern New Jersey is closer to Rhode Island than it is to Florida, right? So <clears throat> from this information, I can fine tune my personalization algorithm using client location to say, here are the possible suggestions out of my, out of my whole database of user information that I can suggest to Kim here. But I'm going to take the client location information and, and fine tune that down and give her at least the ones that she may be interested in that are, are close to her. Now, this is a very young algorithm. We can, we, I can add more to this. But at least, to, at least as a first stab, I'm giving local colleges that are related to the college that the person's looking at to uh, suggest to them. So that's the personalization algorithm. And just kind of a creative way to use client location. Client location, again, is so simple. All that it is is an API call, and you get back a latitude, longitude point. So you can, but with that information, you can do all kinds of things. Um, so here's an example of, of that personalization working. So this is actually an example from the live site. I have uh, a picture of Rutgers University, and I went through this scenario and then backfilled my slides from the scenario, actually. Um, so what we have here is that someone's browsing Rutgers University and su suggesting Brown University. And on the fly for these suggestions, I just do a quick distance calculation, which in your programming language of choice, I'm, I'm sure that the, uh, the algorithm is, is freely out there, just to find a distance from the user's client location that I use to tailor the results to begin with. So um, that's the, the best ranked client personalization. So <clears throat> one of the things that I did right before I came to, to I.O., was tying the translation part uh, to, to VastRank. So one of the pushes that, I, that I've done for VastRank, I added, I added international colleges. Originally, I started with just colleges in the United States. 
is what I was familiar with and so forth. But for anybody who works, who's worked on websites in, um, in general, you realize that there's a huge global audience, right? So I, I especially look at it when I look at my own blog and look at the usage statistics. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's obvious that targeting a, a global audience makes a lot of sense. So my first step was to add, was to add the uh, international colleges, which was just a natural fit. But then, what do you do for international users? There's a lot of out of out of country users that are looking that are looking at colleges in the United States, which I originally had it and launched a site with. So, what's really cool is that the Google has this languages API. It's just an API into what you'd see for Google Translate, right? So, <clears throat> what happens is I just to start off to start simple with translation on my site. I basically look at the at the users. Um, languages accept headers, the HTTP headers that come across, and I figure out what are the languages that this user accepts for their browser. And from that, if it's not English that, they're, that, that they have for their browser language, I'm going to emit a JavaScript call for each one of my reviews on the, on the site. Um, so basically, I say, okay, is this HTTP header English? If it's not, then I'm gonna emit this JavaScript call for each one of my review nodes google.language.translate, and what that's showing there, the, the uh, second argument there is just saying en, because I'm assuming that all of my content is in English right now, um, and then translate it to the user's target language, which I figure out on the server side based on their, on their HTTP headers, right? So, um, and then at the end of that, I make a call. If I do use the Google translation services, there's an API call to get the, the branding that, you, that I put underneath of the, uh, the, user, the user review. So in the future, what I, want to do, what I want to do is I want to detect the actual language that the user is posting in at the time that they post the review because the languages API actually gives you this detect function. So I can, see, I can have someone reviewing a college that's, say, in Germany, and when they post that review, I can have a little JavaScript that goes and, and interrogates the text that they're posting, and I can say, is this, and you can call languages.detect, and it will return back to you its best, it, the, the best that it can determine what that language is for, uh, for what the user is posting. What I'm going to do is I'm going to store that in, in, in a database so that I know that I can translate, for instance, if I'm an English user and I'm looking at, at colleges in Germany for, for whatever reason, I can, t I can um, then on the server side look at the browser, um, the, the HTTP accept headers, and then determine what the translation should be rather than just um, think that everything's in English on, on the site to begin with. So, an example of this: this is actually just screenshots out of uh, out of me going to VastRank and 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 setting my my browser headers, my languages. So, <clears throat> here you just see some English text. This is for uh, I believe Stanford University, and then I changed the language to to German as my primary language in the in the site, and I refreshed the site, and then. Originally, for just a split second, you see the English text, um, but it will immediately translate. It's very, very fast considering how much text it translates on a, on a page and how inefficiently I did this to start off with, um, because I do have batch APIs that I have not made use of. But it's very quick, and it's pretty it's pretty cool way to just on, on the cheap, really fast get translation for your content on your site. So again, VastRank has all of this all of this user review data that could be. Uh, useful to people overseas and so forth. Um, so this was just a really quick way, and I can improve on this. You know, I can start using the using the batch APIs and so forth, and and being smarter about what the original language is and so forth. But just as a, a first step, this took me 40 minutes to implement on 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 VastRank. You know, I just had some controls on the server that I tied this logic into, and it was very very simple. So for 40 minutes, that's not bad. You get translated content in in that amount of time. So. Just the additional APIs that I used. Um, the, the only other API that I'm using right now is the Libraries API from Google. And as I said, when I got invited here to, to, to talk about VastRank, I wanted to revamp a little bit of the JavaScript code, just make sure it was, it was, it was tight. I started to use jQuery, which was, which was really, really nice. And I just used the hosted version at Google so you can launch the, uh, the Languages API and load jQuery directly from Google. And, um, they take care of the caching and, and the versioning and so forth. So that's basically the, uh, the, the APIs that I've used on VastRank um, from Google and some of the thoughts that you have to think through and the, the design thoughts that I had to think through when building this, this site. 
So that's basically uh, the, the session that I have for you today. If there's any questions, feel free to come up to a microphone and, and ask if anyone has any questions. And I, I really thank you for your time and, and coming out. I hope you learned a few things today. So, any questions? <laughs> Oh, could you come up to the mic? They wanted me to uh, have you come up to the mic for so I can get on the uh, video. How many data points have you had success drawing on the map at a given point in time? I'm, I'm sorry? How many points were you able to draw on the map at a given point in time? Uh, that's a good question. Right now, I give it a, a, right now on the map, it's a user option on how many they want to see. It's something that I want to, I want to get to. Um, so if you see here, I just have them choose the max results. So I can give them up to, up to 25 that are in view. But what I want to do is I want to take, I want to actually page through the data. I want to, I want to have it such that you'll see a, a page result of what college was, colleges would be in view and show the top ones first, like in batches of 10, like a paging type algorithm, and then say, as they get through the, t so show me the top ranked schools for academics first out of the batch that's in view. And then I want it to be a paging so that you can go, okay, I'm showing one of a thousand colleges in view, page, 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 and then the, the ordering of those colleges would be in, in order from top rank to lowest rank. And then from that point, I can do the distance-based algorithm. So I can show from close, uh, closest to center point out. I actually wanted to get that done for IO, I just haven't had the time, because um, I think it would be kind of a cool, it would be kind of a cool demo to show that the markers start to grow from the center point of the map out and see it expand. So that's, that's kind of what I'm thinking. But right now, it's a user option. And just from a usability standpoint, the more that you can take off of an application for the user to try to do anything is good. So for, that's my plan on, on improving this in the future. So as you can see, though, 25 and so forth, it's, it's fast. It's, it's no problem whatsoever. But uh, Pamela showed in the earlier session um, the, the clustering, which is a really cool option as well. So any other uh, questions at all? Back to the mic. <laughs> Have you experimented with any um, techniques for centering the map uh, based on the data that's being displayed? Uh, centering the map based on the data that's being displayed. Um, hmm. Well, I, I have not done that personally, but it would be it would be pretty easy to figure it out. You know, you can just you can just take the data that's being displayed and figure out what the maximum uh, latitude longitude points are and then calculate what the, uh, the distance would be to the center point to center the map. So if you have like a set, if I understand correctly, you'd have a set of uh, data that you would have that fixed, wouldn't be like dynamic like this. And if you wanted to calculate at a center point, you know, you just, you just figure out what the maximum and center points are. Um, I haven't thought through it in detail, but you might have to consider that thing that I did with uh, overlapping the, the the uh, international date line, but I would figure you can take the max and mins, figure out what the center point is from those, and then just set, set map center, which is just a call on, on, on the GMAP object, or the, the map object from the Google API to set center, and from that you should be good to go, I would assume. <laughs> I haven't tested it. Um, any, other, any other questions? I guess that's... Uh, well, thank you so much for coming out and saying, coming to the session. I really enjoyed it. Thank you.